Hello world, it's Craig. My video before the last one was about the BPNF file format, which was Intel's first file transfer format, and it was created for submitting truth tables to Intel for fabricating custom mask ROMs. Intel used BPNF for their SIM4 and SIM8 systems, and then in 1974, the Intellect 8 came along, and its resident monitor included not only commands for reading and writing paper tape in BPNF format, but now it included commands for reading and writing paper tape in this new hexadecimal program format, which didn't even have a name at that time, but it later became known as the Intellect Hex format, named after the Intellect Development System. And that's what we just call today the Intel Hex file format. I seem to get a lot of questions where people are having trouble getting code to go into the EEPROM. Either the code seems to be too big, it isn't located in the EEPROM as they're expecting, or there's some issue that, more often or not, is a trivial little detail that's easy, easily corrected as long as they understand how the Intel hex file works. So it's good to know a little bit about this file for when things don't go exactly as hoped, and maybe the file needs to be tweaked a little bit. Or maybe you're writing some code that interacts with the file, like writing a download routine to accept the Intel hex file from a terminal. Now, when you take your source code and run it through your assembler or compiler or what have you, it can spit out a number of files. One usually being the file that's carried forward and will eventually be loaded into your system. Maybe it goes through a linker, a locator, something else, or maybe it's just ready to go as soon as it's assembled or compiled. This output file may be a binary file that contains the actual machine code and it can't be viewed or edited with a normal text editor. Or it may be a number of other formats like Motorola or like what we're talking about here, Intel Hex. Now Intel Hex is just a text-based, human-readable ASCII file that can be opened and edited with any ASCII editor like Windows Notepad or Notepad++, which is what I usually use. We know this is a text-based file because when we opened it, the editor didn't go crazy because everything in this file is a printable character. Now open a binary file and there'll be a combination of printable and non-printable characters. Open it in terminal and sometimes the bell will go off, sometimes the cursor backs up or moves all over. So if we save this program or data as a binary file, but now we're going to open it up and interpret it as an ASCII file, some of these values that were saved, they may happen to be ASCII characters just by coincidence, but they may be control characters or maybe they're just not in the ASCII table at all. So let's look a little bit more at the difference between a binary file and a text file. Let's say, for example, there's an instruction. This is 808885 code. MVI A, and the data is 07. So move immediate the 07 into the accumulator. The assembler is going to convert that to machine code, which for the 8085 is 0011, 1110 for the MVI A, and the data byte is just 0000. 000 0111 for this 07. And if we're going to send that to our receiver as a binary object, it will actually be those binary values in the file. And binary object files are nice because they're very efficient as far as storage space, meaning there's no overhead. To save a byte of data only takes a byte of storage. But we can't read that binary file or edit it without using a special binary file editor. If we tried to print or display this, the MVIA which is the 0011-1110, is 3E in hexadecimal. And so the terminal or whatever is going to display the ASCII ca character greater than, because that's what that is if we look up 3E in the ASCII table. The 07 is ASCII bell character, and so it's going to ring the bell in the terminal. If you, we had a 0C in there, it's going to do a form feed, 09 is a horizontal tab, and the list goes on and on. So when we, we dump this out to the terminal, some things are printable and some things are just control characters that are gonna make the terminal go wild. And you know, back then when working in the terminal room, you could always tell when somebody accidentally tried to display a binary file because the terminal or the teletype would go crazy and the bell would be going off constantly and it'd be scrolling out paper like mad. Now let's convert that MVIA07 instruction into ASCII so it's printable. MVIA was 3E. The 3 in ASCII is 33 hex. The E in ASCII is 45 hex. The 07 will be 30 hex for the 0 and 37 hex for the 7. So that 3E07 in binary 
or in, in ASCII now is 33453037. So that's four bytes of data. We just doubled the amount of paper tape, punch cards, or whatever storage media we're using because we went from two bytes of data to now four bytes of ASCII. But the advantage is that now we can easily edit this file because it's human readable and everything in this file is a printable character. So if we go back and we look at our Intel hex file, there's no crazy business here like when we open the binary file. It's a series of hexadecimal numbers. Except for the leading colon, everything we see in this record represents a hexadecimal byte of information. For example, if we see a 4B in this file, it's obviously two ASCII characters, a 4 and a B. And if we were reading it, we just say 4B, and you automatically think that those two characters represent a byte of information. In binary, that 4B is 01001011. And the upshot is that every two ASCII characters are one byte of data. So there's a little bit of conversion going on when the file is made and when it's received from a byte of data into ASCII. When creating the file, that one byte of data is split into two nibbles, and each nibble becomes an ASCII character. And the opposite is done when the file is received before the data can be put into memory. So always remember that, you know, like nuns, these bytes travel in pairs as two ASCII characters. Now the general format of each line looks like this. We know that it takes two ASCII characters to make a byte. So at a minimum, we can divide this into two character groups. Each line is called a record and it begins with a colon, called the record mark, which signals the start of the record. Remember, this is the only single character allowed. After that colon, everything else is in pairs. So there's two ASCII characters that represent the number of data bytes in this record. Since it's a two character value, or one byte of information, that means that the maximum number of data bytes that can be in this record can be FF, or 255 bytes. And 00 is also a valid number, meaning there's no data in that particular record. Now this is the number of data bytes only, so none of the support values, the preamble here, are included in this count. In this file, most records have 20 hex, or 32 data bytes, in that record. Now after the record length, there are four ASCII characters that provide the starting address of the destination for the data bytes in this record. And these are big Indian, so if the value is 203E, the destination address for the first data byte is 203E, and then the next data byte goes into 203F, 2040, and so forth. In this file, the first one starts at 0000, and they go up in these 32-byte increments each time, because each record has 32 uh, bytes or 20 hex. Now the last preamble byte is the record type, which is another two ASCII characters that were put into future-proof this file format. You know, 50 years on, there's still only a few record types. Zero is just normal data. Zero one represents the end of the file. Zero two, an address offset, and so forth. You can look these up. Depending on you, who you ask, there's really only a handful of these defined, and they tend to become less and less standard as you get away from that first little group. In this file, we can see that everything is a record type 00, except this last record, which is a 01, meaning it's the end of file. Now, I've been known to use this file record type to pass additional information to the receiving system. So for example, if I want the receiving system to do something other than just return to the user prompt after it's downloaded this hex file, I use the type 0E, which is, you know, I just invented that, to tell the receiving system that after the download is complete, as a last step, I want you to put the last address you got into the program counter, which effectively tells the receiving system to jump into some code and execute. So if my receiving program receives the record 002000, 0ED2, when everything else is completed in the last step, it continues the execution at 2000 hex. And actually, I got that idea from some Intel code, but it doesn't seem as though they formalize that as a type. But the concept of including the execution starting point was actually uh, something that Intel was in, in one of their monitors. Okay, so after the record type, then the data starts coming out. And again, it's byte by byte, so there's two ASCII characters for each data byte. 
As noted, the first two characters, this has two zero hex or 32 bytes of data. F3 is the first data byte, 3-1, FF, 1F, and so forth. This is opened in Notepad++, so it knows it's an Intel hex file, and it's colored the data to make it more easily readable for us. Now, the last byte in this record is an error checking byte called the checksum. Checksum is a simple in concept and simple in practice, so it's nothing to fear. It's just the two's complement of the sum of the entire record except for the colon. So let's do this last line because it's nice and short. If we add up the bytes, 0007, 6D, 01, we get 7, 5 in hex. One's complement is 8A, so two's complement is 8B, which is the last byte that's added onto this record. So that's the checksum. Now, for a second, let's pretend to be the receiving program. And we're reading this last byte, or this last record. As the bytes come in, we add them to an 8-bit register. When we get to the last data byte, the sum was 7, 5, as we just did that just a minute ago. For longer records, that 8-bit register will overflow several times, but we are only keeping the last 8 bits. So our value is always only one byte long. We just let everything else roll off to the left. Now the checksum comes in, and just like the other data bytes, we add it to our running total, 7, 5. 7, 5 plus 8B is 1, 0, 0, but we're only keeping the bottom byte, so it's actually just 0, 0. And that's how we know the record was received correctly. If we add up all the bytes in the record, except for the colon, but including the checksum, then the answer should always be zero. If the answer isn't zero, then we need, know that we need to flag a, an error. If we look at this, unless you're actually displaying control characters, you won't notice that each line ends in a new line. Usually it's going to be a carriage return and a line feed, but those are considered white space and are thrown away by the receiver. But if you're writing a receiver program, you need to kind of adapt. You know, you don't know if the sender included a carriage return or a carriage return on a line, line feed or you know, just one or the other or both. Now, there aren't comments in the Intel hex file, but if you're so inclined, you can probably get by with it sneaking in comments in with the other white space. It's just going to get thrown into the bit bucket. At least if, if it were my code, it would just throw away those comments. And that's as long as you don't put a colon in the comments, which is a reserved character, because as soon as it sees the colon, it's going to start expecting these ASCII values. So we saw the maximum number of bytes that could be in any record is 255. When this file was created, they limited a record to 32 bytes, so it would fit nicely on the terminal. 32 bytes plus the preamble and checksum is 37 bytes, which takes 74 characters plus the colon. 75 characters fits nicely in an 80-column terminal. So all of these are data records, except for the last one, which is an end of file record. But you can see that the end of file follows the same format, zero data, some address, the data type is zero one, and then the checksum. The address in this line can be a little bit of a wild card. The assembler that I use puts in the program counter when the end pseudo opcode was processed. Now let's finish up by looking at how crappy EEPROM programming software can throw a wrench in this whole process. Here's a list file for a resident monitor for this MCS85 minimum system. And for the most part, this is meant to go into an EEPROM, but I can also use the hex file to download into another data ROM and also into RAM. This isn't just for programming EEPROMs. So here in the code, I make some ROM reservations that are in this program EEPROM, and then up here I make some RAM reservations that are going to be up in the RAM. And finally, here at the end, I have some data that goes into another ROM, which is a data ROM that, that's up higher. Now, the assembler handles all these correctly. It creates the Intel hex file that looks like this. Here's the ROM reservations at 07F5, the RAM reservations at 18B0, and the data up here at 2800 hex. Now, also note, I'm bouncing around the program counter to load interrupt locations, and that's the reason why a number of these are just three data records because they're at different addresses. These are all vector interrupts being loaded. So now let's load this file into our XGECU programmer or whatever it is to program into an EEPROM. And it won't load correctly. It did the first record down here at 7F0, which was that version number that I reserved in the ROM. But when it got to the RAM reservations, it crapped out and it didn't come back. Now, if I had selected the EEPROM that included this whole memory space, then it would have loaded everything okay. Or if I select an offset to only do the RAM or only do the data ROM, then it does that portion okay. 
say if I offset just the 1800 part, that loaded okay. Or the 2800 part, see that loads okay. The problem is that for some reason, this software does not like moving the destination pointer up to an area that's not in this EEPROM device and then moving the pointer back into the EEPROM space. So to get it to load properly, I need to either delete these four lines that define the RAM values or move them down in the file so that they're in the correct space so the memory pointer isn't having to move back and forth. So let's move them down here so that the memory pointer doesn't have to move back up. These four lines here, we cut them. And down here where they belong, we paste them. We save it, open the file, load it, and now it reads the file okay. So who knows what their thought process is? You know that, But that's the sort of tweaking that you may need to do to get the Intel hex file to load properly. It's not your fault you know, if some of these things don't load. And I've never had any problem on any of my vintage programmers. You know, they fully understood the concept of the Intel hex file. In the next video, we'll go over some assembly language code to send or receive these Intel hex files. In the meantime, that's it for this video. As always, this channel isn't monetized, so if you get anything out of the videos, please like, subscribe, or share it. Thanks for watching. Talk with you later. Bye-bye.